so a, a bit about my background. I, I mean, I've been data modeling um, since 1987. Uh, I was involved in some of the early methodology groups um, around SSADM. That's a long dead uh, method. And also with Oracle in, in the early days when they started to develop their data modeling toolkit. Um, so been involved with data modeling a lot on and off. I think it's a special kind of work. Um, so it needs you to concentrate um, quite deep, deep to get the models right. You need to have an attention to detail uh, and also more broad brush uh, structures. You need facilitation skills to go out there and talk to users, technical users, technical experts to understand the, the business concepts behind the model that you're producing. Uh, you need business understanding to be able to reflect what you hear. You need technical knowledge, the underlying databases, how they work, performance and so forth, and language skills, the ability to find appropriate words and to communicate clearly. So it's not really um, a, a job for everyone to do. It fits certain personalities better than others. Now, data modeling is not really uh, uh, well known as an agile, uh, agile skill. But um, when I learned about data vaults, I found that uh, it provided me with techniques and patterns I could use to move that modeling skill into uh, agile ways of working, you know, refactoring, incremental build out and so forth. So finding uh, data vault modeling very powerful. Now I'm going to talk today about five topics. Uh, very difficult to actually pick the topics involved. So I, I've picked five that I commonly see out there with, with clients that I work with. So the first one of which is, is getting started. So how do you start with a blank canvas and build out your, your first model? How should you approach that? Second challenge is extremes, modeling in the extremes. So where uh, a project may model unnecessary detail, in some of the, um, the, the data structures that are there. And I'll show you an example of that in that section. Units of work, a very classic issue around uh, over-normalization. Breaking the standards, repeated over and over again, keep to the standards, please. So I'll show you an example of, of where breaking the standards went wrong. Um, and then the dilemma between is an object that you're modeling a hub or is it a link? Um, and what does, that, what does that mean? How can you resolve that? But there's plenty more in the mix and you probably have some favorites yourself that you would, uh, would like me to cover. So please, please do, um, use, the, do use the, um, the forum to, to raise questions if you have any. And also please, can you put on the uh, chat as well for, uh, for questions as we go. All right, so first, the first topic. Well, actually, before I get into there, I'll, I'll bring you, I'll give you some, some observations about the data modeling technique itself. Now, I think um, the, one of the strengths of Data Vault is that we have a limited set of table types to work with. So I like to think of it like an artist's palette. You've got a limited set of colors, and it's up to you as the, uh, the data modeler, data architect, to work with those colors to build a picture of the business that you're working with. So when you work with that, you know, you have your satellites, hubs and links, the traditional three parts, but there's plenty of other table types to work with. Well, not plenty of others, but, 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 but a few others to, to factor into the model. And um, depending on the artist you have or the data modeler at work, you might have an abstract model produced. So they work at the, the high end of, uh, of, of, of abstraction. You will have parties, locators, events, all those sorts of things modeled in your diagram. Um, the next architect, the next data model to come along, they might be a bit more physical in modeling. They may actually use objects that you can relate to in the real world that you're, you're looking at in the business. Now, it's interesting because you've effectively got the same building blocks, but different results. 
And I've been, been party to many discussions in, in clients where they, they sort of say, do we want an abstract model? Do we want some more physical model? You know, which is the best? Well, just like art, you can't really compare these together. You know, they are both representations. They may even be painting the same scene for all you know. Um, it really is down a little bit down to taste. So the answer is, is it depends. They may be both mathematically equivalent to each other, but there are other factors involved in there which, which may make, make you tend towards one or the other, depending on the circumstances of the model that you're working with. So first rule I would say there is that data modeling is actually an art, not a science. Um, so if you've got two different data modelers at work, you're going to get two different uh, data models out at the far end. And that's either good or bad, depending on your perspective of, of what's going on here. And I think that that choice is good because um, it gives you flexibility and offers you different ways to solve the same problem. So if you explore one avenue and it doesn't seem to work well, you can reverse back out and try some other avenue in there or even a third or fourth style until you get one that, one that works for you. The problem with that though is it does mean you have to make decisions about which way you're actually gonna go with and, and you have to engage your brain in, in the modeling. So that's rule two. Data vault modeling requires you to apply judgment and the application of common sense. On rule three, when you look to for a decision on the best way to model a situation, you'll often hear the words, it depends. So I've sat in uh, groups of people evaluating a model. Um, one's advocating for more abstract, one's advocating for a more physical version of the model. And um, it goes round in circles, which is the best picking way forward. So really on the face of it, when you first learn data vault, data vault modeling, it looks easy. Yeah? You've got simple building blocks to work with, some simple rules to work with. But that's what you see above the waves, above the water level. When you go below the water level, you're dealing with data. Now, data in organizations can throw up all kinds of issues. Um, some, some organizations, the data is really nice and clean, but most organizations, the data is quite messy, source data is quite messy. Data Vault gives you a way of tackling that data, but whichever method you use, not just Data Vault, whichever method you use for modeling, it, it can throw up uh, issues about how's the best way to model this, how's the best way to, to bring this into our data warehouse. Um, and there are heuristics out there that can help you take a perspective on some of those data formats, data issues helps you to solve them. And it's one of those things which you pick up over time. So as you get more experienced, you develop a craft for data modeling, and that helps you cope with the situations that come your way. So another rule in there, data vault modeling rewards the application of experience. You can't replace experience to um, get a good data model out at the far end. Okay, so my first issue, getting started on a data vault model. So you're just about to start on, the, on, your, on your, uh, your modeling. You've got all these source systems you'd like to bring into the data vault. And there are lots and lots of tables attached to those systems. So it's a bit daunting. Lots and tables to bring in, lots to load. Where do I start? How do I pick which table to load first? Now, there's a mistake. If you just say, well, I've got lots to do, um, I just need to start at the beginning and work through that table list, building and building out the data model, then I'll solve my problem. I'll just keep working at this, keep bringing data in at high speed. I'd say that's probably not the best way to get started. Okay, data modeling 
is not a purely mechanical process. Yeah, you'll get uh, vendors out there saying, yes, all you have to do is to point your tool at this big data set, all these tables, press a button, and as if by magic, you'll have a data vault data model uh, ready for you to, to process. Now, um, why is that? Now, I've, I've uh, used to work on systems implementation projects before I got really heavily into uh, data warehousing, used to implement um, you know, Oracle financials, SAP systems, and so forth. And um, it was very interesting to sort of lift the lid on the screens that were, were in front of users and look at the data model that's hidden behind the scenes there. And it, and it is quite an eye opener. And you'll see this whichever system you work with. Those systems that are deployed, particularly the, uh, the, the uh, commercial off the shelf systems, they usually developed quite a few years ago. And the usual life is that those systems are developed for a, a specific customer and the implementation was very successful. So it was decided to convert the system into a general product that could be sold to other customers. But despite best efforts, very often those source systems still retain terminology and business practices rooted in the original customer that the system was built for. Then over time, the company hires developers, they join the firm, they leave, and each of them has a different style of coding, a different style of working. So you can almost look at the source system and detect which part of the system was worked on by each type, each developer. Um, I often think that would be a great form of uh, new archeology span actually, to be able to um, unpick a system and determine the layers in there going back to the original version. And um, so basically these, these developers, they have maybe experimented with different design approaches. Maybe there's bits of the, um, the computer language they're using that they want to experiment with and, and look at. Um, and so you get these, this sort of diversity of approaches in, the, in that system. And very often things like redundant code, redundant tables were never removed. Component comments were not updated and, and the documentation is out of date or non-existent. So really it's, a, it's like a, a common law of entropy here. A system starts off clean for one, one client and over time it, it, uh, it gets worse. And then, when you want to add new features to the source system, um, you know, managers are given a choice. Can we clean up what we've got or add a new feature? They'll always add new features. So you're getting layers and layers of new stuff bolted onto the basic system. So if you're bringing in source systems, you're gonna have messy, inefficient table structures in there that drive the system as it is in, in um, production use for, regular process support, but it's certainly not something we want to bring straight into our data vault or into our, even any, any data solution at all, because we'll be bringing in fictitious concepts, so hubs that, that make sense in the source system, but not really for reporting purposes. We'll have misnamed concepts. We'll, we may see key value pair extended attributes, um, generic processes, extensive use of surrogate keys everywhere, and over generic roll-ups and codes in place. Not helpful um, when it comes to your analytics platform. So we bring them in as is, if we bring them in raw into our data vault, we're kind of saying to our developers, um, we're not solving this problem for you. We're gonna pass this through to our reporting layer and let our users sort out the, this mess rather than trying to clean some of it up in our data model. So these to rule five, which is source system based data vault models as the data vault design are an anti pattern. But you can use the source system data models to validate that a more clean top down model can be populated. So if you are starting a, a, a process off for building out your data vault, the ideal is to build a business model first, a business context first, a top down view of what it is you want. Okay, so you need to go out there and look at the business processes that are being performed, uh, find the concepts around those processes, 
the, the events that occur and those processes and identify the units of work involved and then use that to start to build out a more ideal view of what your analytics should be. And then you look at the reality, the data that we have coming in from the source. And then we can resolve the differences between them. Because there's no sense building a, a top-down model that can't be populated by data that comes from source. So I've made that mistake as well by modeling some interesting um, concepts only to find they don't exist in the source or in the way you thought they did. But at the same time, we don't want to over, um, over move towards the, the source structures as well. So it's a balance between what we'd like to have the ideal and the reality of the data coming in. So when you ask the question, how do I start modeling? It's a kind of spiral. You do a bit of top down, bit of bottom up reality check, a bit more top down, a bit more bottom up. And the aim to, is to arrive with a sort of clean looking hub and link structure in place um, where we, are, we, we have a, a practical way of mapping the bottom up, the, the source data into that structure. Is that the easy let's roll? So the data vault actually is our opportunity to escape the limitations of the source systems, yeah? but only if the data is there to populate the, the model that we wish to build. And the business has to be involved. So your data vault modelers have to be talking to subject matter experts. The data modeling is as much about the communication between them and business alignment as it is about the technology and the databases that run underneath. I can see a conversation going. I can't read it in time as we because we're going. We'll come back to it in a minute. So that's the first the first uh, um, common issue, which is how do I get started? It's a, it's a mix of top down and bottom up to build an ideal solution. Okay, extremes. Let me give you an example. I have a sale, and that sale is made on a day which exists in a month, in a quarter, in a year. Okay, so we've got a standard sort of roll up there for, for sales reporting. But we also know that days exist in weeks and the weeks don't really align cleanly with the months and the quarters. So we've got an alternative way of rolling up our, our sales if you want to report by week. Okay, so we have a roll up pattern here for our, our calendar. And we also may have a roll up for our sales geography. So sales made in a district office within a country, within a region. Now, um, I've seen a, a beginning data modeler sit down, look at this and saying, all I have to do is to follow the data vault rules. Okay, and then they follow the rules mechanically and they end up with something like this. Okay, so they've taken every component on that roll up and created a hub for them, and then stuck all the links all the way up the hierarchy, put effectivity satellites off the links, had satellites describing every hub, and you end up with something that uh, looks a bit messy. And they say, well, that's what Data Vault says we have to do. That's, that's the model that we have to produce here. Um, and the hint there, of course, is no, Data Vault doesn't say you have to do it that way at all. Data Vault provides you with the palette to work with. You have to engage your thinking process in modeling these things. So let's have a look. There's a smell here. Yes, we call these smells, which are indications that something might be wrong. So we, we started off with nine source tables, and we blew that up to 38 targets. So we have an explosion of hubs. We've got seven links just to model the calendar, three links to model the geography. Can you imagine the SQL you'll have to write to extract data from this? All this navigation up and down through the links and hubs and satellites and checking for effectivities. It really is a mess. 
And um, the projects where they did something similar to this actually um, collapsed. They had lots and lots of these hierarchies all mapped out to this extreme. And they wondered why none of the queries they wrote has any performance in them. So that's wrong. Maybe mathematically correct, but wrong in the way you're going. We should be modeling units of work, assemblies or, or equivalences, same as um, links. So let's have a look in here. We have, actually, we've got a calendar, we have a geography, and we have a sale working. Okay, the calendar is the join of the, the grain of the days, weeks, months, quarters, and years. So we should be able to have basically an entry in the link for every day that we have, and then be able to map that across to the weeks, months, quarters, and years involved there. Very similar to what you'd see in a, a calendar dimension in a Kimball architecture. We also have a geography assembly. We have districts, countries, and regions. And then finally, we have this business event, the unit of work, which is our sale that's been made. And that's the sale was made on a day inside a district, and then the whole assembly works here and reduces the, the volume of um, entities on here quite, quite significantly. But we can go further than this, obviously. So let's have a look at what we can do. Now, year, quarter, month, week, they're all types of, of calendar period. And likewise, the district, region, country, they're all types of geography. So we could add, start to abstract this down a bit, okay? So we could have a hub for a day and the satellite could vary the attributes attached to that in terms of the, the week, month, quarter, year, and the district could do the same thing. I'm not saying this is the, the best way of modeling it, I'm just saying it's an alternative way of modeling it. And it certainly reduces down number of entities that we have modeling down to the essence of what we're trying to, to show here. Okay, but then, well, hang on. These are largely static values. Okay, so if you're loading this data vault over and over again, every time you receive a, a feed, why are you trying to inject data into the calendar and district structure if it's fixed over and over again? Maybe what we're dealing with here is reference data. In which case we can build reference tables. We can reference those from our satellite and reduce the whole model down to single entity, which is the sale, which actually is the essence of what we're trying to model here, the sale. We didn't want the roll-ups to start dominating the way this model's been built. So that's one way of doing it. Um, a more modern way of doing it is reference tables are, are, can also be modeled as their own hubs and satellites there. That's more common way of modeling. And the, uh, effectively the satellite has a foreign key point out to the particular reference document data that we are, are working with. And as with the data vault standards, those foreign keys aren't actually, uh, aren't actually realized. So, which is best? Are we going for the assemblies and units of work? Do we want to reduce them down to reference type information? Do we want to move to reference hubs and satellites? Keith, you're right. It depends. Actually, it's best if you pick one and go with it than debate it for three weeks and argue over which one has a marginal advantage over the other. You're better off picking a way forward and, and pushing ahead with it and building, and maybe refactoring later if you have to, rather than dithering and worrying about, about which way to go. So that leads to a rule, which is when faced with a choice, remember that each option is valid, and the choice is what's the most appropriate variation for our particular project's needs. Okay, third issue, looking at units of work and granularity. 
so um, we get data vault modelers who come to the picture from doing enterprise data architecture. Um, so they come, a look, come along, look at the, the data vault model and they put on their data architects goggles and they see all the problems through the image of a enterprise data architect. And data architecture encourages you to normalize, put in abstractions and apply patterns. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. But again, we're talking about judgment here. So should we use them to an extreme or should we use them to inform what we're doing? So I'll give you an example. We have uh, maybe an insurance, insurance business and I've sold a, a life insurance policy. And the life insurance policy is, is being derived from a quote that was given as a policyholder, as a beneficiary, person insured, policies underwritten, and the policy covers a period, maybe a year, um, for, for the start and end date of the policy validity. Okay, so you start to model that and you do this. So you have a policy, it's valid for a period, each period is linked to a quote, has a holder, life insured underwriter. So you end up with um, a whole series of two-way mappings linked to different concepts that were brought in to model the, the policy. Nothing wrong with that necessarily, but when you think about it, why, well, what would you do if you were reporting from this? So the creation of a policy is probably something that you're going to be reporting on quite frequently. So to create that, you're going to have to navigate through the whole model up and down through the links to, to reassemble um, the events that caused the creation of most of these entities in the first place. All right, so now we need to put our data vault modeling goggles on where we want to model units of work. So we want to convert a quote yeah, we're converting a quote into a policy is basically a business event that occurs. In other words, it's a unit of work. So the granularity of that unit of work is driven by the concepts that are involved in that unit of work, quote, policy holder, person insured, and so on. So we would model it in data vault like something like this. So we have our various concepts in there and I've stuck the period into the link as a, as a sort of degenerate uh, column in there because uh, uh, hub period doesn't make sense as a, as a separate hub in its own right. Okay, much easier now to query the conversion of a quote to a policy because we have now equi joins out to the hubs involved in the construction of that business event. So it's a slightly different perspective on the, uh, the modeling but it's designed for uh, improved performance um, in, in measuring and reporting on, on the events that we were interested in. Okay, fourth issue, breaking the standards. Okay, so uh, I've seen clients that have said, I didn't get trained in Data Vault, but I'm on my first project. And I looked at some of the data vault building blocks and I decided to make some improvements. Oh, by the way, the project failed. So clearly data vault isn't appropriate for our kind of project. And there may be all kinds of reasons for, for project failure and it, it may not be just down to, uh, to modifying the standards, but standards are there for a reason. If I can draw a analogy here, if I have a car and I repeatedly crash it into a wall, maybe the car's at fault, maybe the wall's at fault, but it's most likely to be that the car has been driven improperly without due care and attention. And data vault modeling is a little bit like this. You're given the freedom of the road with data vault modeling. It's up to you as the data modeler to avoid the walls in the way. 
So why do we have standards in Data Vault? Well, Data Vault is specially designed to deliver all these sorts of things, integration, auditability, incremental build, refactoring, support for automation, patterns, point in time information, and so on. And therefore, if you want these benefits out of your data model, you have to model and build your models in a particular way, which are why the standards are there. So don't play with the standards until you've had a chance at least to use them and appreciate why they're there so that you know what happens if you are relaxing any of them. I mean, I certainly, when I first started with Data Vault, I didn't understand why certain things were in place, but I, but I just followed the standards. And then something happened on the project and I was thankful that the standards were there because they rescued me. So things like um, you know, early on in the project, I, uh, uh, particularly my first project, so I, I did a, a, um, a, a dumb load. I loaded some data in I shouldn't have done into the warehouse. Well, with the auditability and timestamps on them, I could easily find that data and remove it. And it saved my bacon in many occasions there in doing that. So rule nine, pretty please follow the standards. I don't want to be too heavy on it. It's just a nice thing to do and it's a beneficial thing to do. But the sort of caveat for that is that not following the standards is actually a major cause of, of project failure, not the only one, but can be one of the major causes of project failure. So, so please do follow them and, uh, and uh, you'll see the benefits of that as well. So follow the standards. That, so the standards for the project should talk about the building blocks. You should follow the hubs, links, and satellites. Don't create a new one. Um, they have standard metadata, standard ways of naming columns, standard ways of naming tables, the connections you're allowed to make between the tables, and how we handle business rules and so on. So until you understand why those standards are there, please, please don't flex the rules. And then the final issue, it's a bit like Superman. Is it a hub? Is it a link? No, it's Superman. We have, um, there are hidden concepts sometimes in models that, that modelers fail to spot. And basically the, the difference between a hub and a link and when you use one or the other is, is quite a knotty little problem to solve. So I'll give you an example. Um, so we have uh, a finance system. Okay, so we have a journal and there are transactions logged in that journal. Okay, but each transaction has two or more postings made against the accounting system. And those transactions will balance. These are account postings, basically, transaction detail lines. Okay, so they, they link across to the account. But we want to, or we would naturally tend to think about the links being connected. Yeah, because a, a transaction has two or more transaction details that will inherit the primary key of the link in the second link. But we say in Data Vault that we can't connect them, can't connect them at all. So we've got to remove that red line and model the situation in, in a clean Data Vault way. And the reason that we, we eliminate that red link is because it, it, it spoils the, the loading patterns and it, it affects the, um, the parallel nature of which we, we, under which we can load. Okay, so let's have a look at the keys, primary keys in there. So the journal, we'll have a journal name, journal date, probably as, the, as, its, as its primary key. Transactions have IDs because they are sort of sequential uh, events that happen in the business. And the detail would have a, an ID and a detail sequence in there as, as the identifiers. Okay, account would have an account code or something to identify it. So we've got this possibility here. We can link the transaction to the journal. We can link the transaction details to the journal as well. And that transaction ID is repeated across both of those links without putting the link in there. So we know that we can join those link, link status together 
on that transaction ID, we just don't put a physical foreign key link in there. That's one way of modeling this. But hang on. What if the transaction is referenced elsewhere, not just in the detail? If that transaction is involved in other, uh, other links across the, the data model, we're going to end up with quite a, um, a cumbersome looking um, set of, of links there with these, this transaction ID repeating in many places without any physical uh, connections being shown. So maybe that link transaction is actually a hub because hubs can be involved in other links. But hang on, we've then got a hub transaction and a link transaction, same name. What's going on? What's going on here? Well, maybe we can model it this way. So we have a unit of work for a journal transaction and a unit of work for the postings that have happened there. We're modeling different grain. So the grain of the transaction detail involves more hubs than the, the journal entry itself. That's a way of modeling that. And guess what? Which is best? Well, it depends. It's up to you. And there's maybe other ways to model this as well. But I've been around this particular um, discussion over and over again as I'm connected, as, I, as I'm talking to uh, various finance uh, departments on data vault modeling issues. So that's one, one area, but you also get issues with semantics. So it's the old problem of the English language that sometimes we use a word to mean more than one thing. And because we use that word, your modeler thinks there's only one thing there. So one word could be used, for example, to express a concept, which is a hub, and a link, which is, which is an, an event. So as a result, maybe source systems may only have one table to cover off both items, and you're not sure what table type to use. So let me give you an example. We have here a contract. Yeah, purchaser signs a contract with a supplier. So the contract itself may be modeled as an event, contracting event. The business agrees a contract with a supplier. So we have hub supplier, hub purchaser. But is link contract the best way to model this? What about that? Maybe hub contracts referenced elsewhere. Do we need to create this, this hub contract? So we've then got two tables with the same name, hub contract and link contract. That can't be right. So if you look at the language a little bit more carefully, We're using the word contract to describe, first of all, the type of document that records the legal agreement. But we're also using contract to describe the event that we agreement is being reached between two parties. So actually, we have two things going on there inside the same language, inside the same statement. Contract being a document and a contractual agreement being the unit of work or the event that's happened. So that can be implied by the language, but can be quite difficult to spot. And if you don't spot it, then you're, you're sort of yo-yoing back between, is it a hub, is it a hub, is it a link, is it a hub, is it a link, is it both? Um, so you end up with a model that looks something like that. Yep. So you have your contract in there and the link is more phrased around uh, an event or a business process. Okay, so those are the five areas to talk about. Loads more out there. I mean, when is a transaction, when does that become a non-historized link? How do we get effectivity satellites to work? How do we handle history when history changes? What's their no business key? And we have a plethora of system surrogates to use. And there's some asked on the, uh, the, the, the chat as well. Uh, pits and bridges, how do we use them? Um, and so on. So I shall go back. There's a lot of questions on here, which is great. So obviously I've been doing, uh, stimulating some discussion. So anyway, for a conclusion, um, data modeling is really a, a different type of data modeling. It's a separate branch um, alongside um, sort of star schema modeling, um, 
conceptual modeling, logical modeling, physical modeling. Base vault modeling is a separate branch because it uses these standard building blocks, but it's quite rich and varied. And is great because it supports the agile incremental build of your warehouse. So you can start modeling a bit and then add to it. But you know, no matter what modeling technique you use, you're still dealing with awful or with all the data that's out there and the infinite variety and in ways that it can make complexity for you. So Data Vault gives you some tools to deal with it um, and experience is needed to, to solve those modeling challenges. And I think the modeling step itself is not automatable. I think it can be supported by tools and smart assistants, but you can't just press a button and expect a data vault to be generated. So you can't eliminate thinking and experience here.